Good evening, everybody. That's pretty good. All right. It's November. That's pretty good. So, good. All right. So, my name is Ray Andrade. I am a, a LMU alumnus who now serves the LMU community as the student engagement librarian. And on behalf of the entire library team, welcome. Welcome to the library and welcome to Faculty Pub Night, the November edition. So, for tonight's event, um, we are going to be welcoming Dr. Melody Rodari. Assistant Professor of Art History at LMU's College of Communication and Fine Arts. And for tonight's event, Dr. Rodari will discuss her chapter, Returning Home, The Journey and Afterlife of Repatriated Objects. And this will be featured in the forthcoming book, Sourcing the Arts of South Asia, Culture of Collection, which will be published by the University of Florida Press. But before we formally begin tonight's program, just a few words about Faculty Pub Night. Um, like the name implies, Faculty Pub Night, please don't be misled. It's not for faculty only, so students, I applaud you for figuring it out. It's not for faculty only. Um, it does say pub in it, so we do feature some classy booze, wine, and beer at the back. <laughs> There is a bartender, though, so students, please do not try to be slick. Eric, our bartender, will check IDs, won't you, Eric? Good. <laughs> All right. So as you could already tell, the format for Faculty Pub Night is totally chill. So at any point, if you want to grab some food and drink, please do so at your leisure. Um, another thing about Faculty Pub Night is that we are going to be collecting feedback, too. So on your seats, you should see a form like this that's being modeled by our dean of the library, Chris Brancolini. Thank you, Dean Brancolini. So please let us know your thoughts. Let us know how to improve or just remind us about how wonderful we are, please. Um, otherwise, at the end of the event, my library outreach buddy, John with the camera, the paparazzi, will be swiping you in for Leo credit if you want to swipe in on Leo, okay? So without further ado, I'm going to introduce one of my LMU favorites, um, Dr. Elaine Walker, Assistant Dean from the College of Communication and Fine Arts. Dr. Walker. Thank you. It is my great pleasure to say good evening to everyone and to introduce to you and present to others, my friend and colleague, Professor Rodari. I will mention some of her professional accomplishments because she is awesome. And she's done a lot of wonderful things that you can look up more in detail. And then I'm gonna speak from my heart and tell you who she is to me and why tonight is so important. And for her to allow me to share or ask me to share in this way means a lot. Thank you, Melody. In addition to being assistant professor, our speaker tonight is an editor, a former curator, assistant curator of Asian art. She earned her doctorate from UCLA, and there she minored in Chinese art history. She is the recipient of 17 awards, fellowships, and grants. Published scholar, writer, historian, panelist, public speaker, she has presented 16 conference papers, probably more by now. She has extensive mu museum experience, has worked on gorgeous exhibitions. She's done archeological field work and over a decade of service. She speaks six languages, varying degrees of fluency, but how many of us speak more than two? So that's the professional side, and now the personal side. I met Professor Rodari, or Melody, about three years ago. It seems like we've known each other a long time, or it feels that way to me, because she makes me feel so comfortable when I'm around her. In 2016, at the invitation of our dean who made this possible, both Melody and I traveled as CFA, or College of Communication and Fine Arts representatives, along with a group of eight LMU educational ambassadors to China. That's a long trip. She sat near me on the plane. I slept most of the way there because I took something to help with busyness. <laughs> but once we got there, I was able to learn from her. She is so knowledgeable about art. And she made some of the pieces come alive for me in ways that I never could have gotten in any other way unless I had you know, a personal tutor. 
uh, that I could ask questions of, or I watched what interested her. I watched where she went. She's very physically fit, so she sort of outclimbed, outwalked almost all of us. But um, again, her quiet, professional, learned way kind of gave our group a sense of history that um, I just don't think we could have appreciated unless we had Melody there. Not even someone like Melody, but I believe Melody. And I thank you again for the way that you just subtly and quietly led us without trying to, to a natural leader. And it came across as we toured and learned more about the sites that we visited. I will say, so that we can hear from her, that in addition to the knowledge that she has in her discipline, she's fun. She was so much fun to hang out with. She and I talked about everything from children to family life, what it is to be a wife and mother. We talked about our kids in particular, buying homes, our faiths, world travel, family life, and family life in a very particular way. She and I both share a humor about our relationships with our mothers. And we both have extraordinary mothers, but we have these interesting stories that across cultures, ah, what do you know, folk or folk. Um, and we talked about what it means to be women in higher education and women of color in our world today. For me and for many of you, Melody is a treasure. She is gifted. She's down to earth. She is a beautiful soul. Ladies and gentlemen, Melody Rodari. Thank you, Elaine. That was really um, more than I could have asked for. Uh, thank you, John, and to everyone at the William H. Hannon Library for putting together the annual faculty pub night. And a special thanks to Carol, who made all of the arrangements for our libations and food this evening. And again, I want to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Elaine Walker for not only introducing me, but she's been a really important mentor to me since I've arrived here at LMU. And for that, I'm truly grateful. <clears throat> the title of my talk this evening, Returning Home, The Journey and Afterlife of Repatriated Objects, comes directly from a book chapter, as Ray had mentioned, that I wrote for Arts of South Asia, Cultures of Collecting. <clears throat> oh, let's see. <clears throat> which we published by the University of Florida Press in the spring of 2019. Much of this talk will be centered on the research that came out of this project. However, I will end the talk with a discussion of my more recent thoughts on issues of art repatriation since I first wrote this essay in 2016. The ability of humans to make art is among one of the traits that distinguishes us from other species, and our desire to collect it and display it dates back many millennia, which is accounted for both in texts and in the visual record. Perhaps one of the earliest known examples of the idea of the museum as a space for the display of art and artifacts dates back to 1158 BCE, when the Elamite king, Shutrak Nahute, took with him the spoils of victory in Babylon and exhibited them as part of his royal collection in Susa. His collection included the Akkadian stele of Narasim, which you see here, <coughs> which is now housed at the Musée de Louvre in Paris. Much like King Shutrak Nahute's collection in Susa, the modern museum, especially that of the Encyclopedic Museum, has its roots in the colonial and imperial enterprise of mostly Western empires, which sought to display their influence and bounty of their conquests. Today, museums serve many functions. They are repositories and caretakers of art and artifacts. <coughs> they are places of education, in addition to serving as spaces for entertainment. According to the International Council on Museums, otherwise known as ICOM, 
quote, a nonprofit permanent institution in the service of society it is <clears throat> and its development. It's open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment, unquote. Many of the Western world's great museums are members of ICOM, subscribing to the codes of ethics, and thus serve as spaces for the protection of our collective human history and education and enjoyment of those who cross their thresholds. However, museums have increasingly seen their institutions serve as spaces of contested histories, with calls for the repatriation of objects from their collections. These museums have been asked directly by foreign governments, nations, officials, by their own governments, or through the lobbying of private individuals to return parts of their collections to their place of origin. Although legitimately acquired, such objects often have illicit paths. Their routes of travel out of their source countries are sometimes well documented, but more often they are taken out during periods of conflict and war, with little trace of their journeys. Yet still others are associated with known dealers, making their provenance highly suspect. Calls for the return of cultural property by nations, states, communities, institutions, and individuals take on many forms, and their appeals are often couched by the R's, as I call them. Return, repatriation, restoration, reconstruction, and reunification. Each of the R's represents different but similar facets of a desire to reclaim property, which is perceived to have been wrongfully taken. In the, res in the recent past and into the present, calls for the repatriation of cultural property have been made by once colonized nation nations, such as that of India and Cambodia, or those subject to the destruction of war, thereby putting their cultural sites and art in peril, such as Pakistan, <coughs> Afghanistan, and Syria. However, the earliest regulation preventing the export of cultural property dates to 1464, when Pope Pius II wrote a decree against the export of art out of the Papal States, suggesting that issues of cultural property and its control is not only a problem of modern nation states. The movement of South and Southeast Asian artworks and their housing in European and American collections often predated national laws protecting the removal and export of cultural property in these countries. While the Treasure Trove Act of 1878 in India was among one of the earliest legislations written to protect archaeological materials or other historically valuable materials, nowhere is it written that they were prohibited from export or removal from its borders. This makes sense, as India was at the time a colony of the British Empire. Prohibition against the movement of art and valuable materials would have prevented the British from collecting and displaying objects at home, meaning um, Britain, such as this 5th century stone sculpture of Buddha Shakyamuni from Sarnath, which entered the collection of the British Museum in 1880, and the Koinor diamond, which was gifted by representatives of the East India Company to Queen Victoria in 1850. You can see that she's wearing it here. Approach. After the fall of the state of Punjab in 1849, the diamond was later prominently inset to jewelry, <coughs> into, inset to jewelry worn by Queen Victoria and later placed at the center of the royal crown worn by Queens Alexandra, Mary, and Elizabeth, and is now housed in the Tower of London. These two objects reflect similar but very different imperial agendas. The removal of the Gupta period Buddhist sculpture reflected a curiosity and desire to document the religions and cultures of their new colony and its subjects, whereas the Kohinoor diamond, long an object of imperial authority and legitimate legitimacy in South Asia was a symbol of the bonds of union within the British Empire and ultimately Britain's, sub <coughs> Britain's author authority and India's subjugation. It was not until the Antiquities Export Control Act of 1947 that legislation had been put in place explicating regulation over the export of antiquities. While the 1947 Act coincided with the independence of India, the act was enacted several months prior to the Indian Independence Act of 1947 of July 18th, when Parliament in Britain officially partitioned British India. This 1947 act was later repealed and replaced by the Antiquities and Treasures Act of 1972, which included control over movable cultural property consisting of antiquities and art treasures. <coughs> The 1972 Act, which continues to be augmented and is still in force today, also regulates export of antiquities and art treasures in order to prevent smuggling and fraudulent dealings in these materials. 
Such laws came into place because it had become very apparent that the cultural property of India was in danger, as the scale of objects leaving the country in the 1960s and the 1970s had become unprecedented because the prices European and American collectors were willing to pay reached as high as six and seven figures, and that's in um, US dollars. In Southeast Asia in particular, and right now we're focusing on Cambodia, regulation protecting historic sites also appeared during colonial occupied years. When Siam, now Thailand, ceded control of Cambodia to France in 1907, the March 23rd Treaty of 1907 was signed. The 1907 treaty ensured that the provinces of Battambang, Sisopan, and Siam Reap were returned to Cambodia, then a colony of France. These provinces, particularly Siam Reap, <coughs> which is the site of the great Angkorian Empire, are rich with art and architecture. While the 1907 treaty does not have specific language regulating against the export of cultural property, it was put to use to this effect during the colonial period. In 1927, Andro Marot, who would become the first prime, uh, French Minister of Cultural Affairs in 1959, was arrested in France when he tried to import sculptures from the 10th century Hindu temple of Bantai Sre, which you see here. His goal was to sell the sculptures to collectors and museums in France. In his defense, Malraux argued that the temple had been renuli, or abandoned property, and thus belonged to no one. Moreover, he argued the objects had been lost, and thus, by recirculating them, he was in fact rescuing them. In the end, Malraux was sentenced to imprisonment for one year and prohibited from entering certain areas for eight months. The sculptures that he had removed from Bantai Sre were restored to the temple within a year. So all of this didn't prevent him from becoming the French Minister of Cultural Affairs in 1959, uh, obviously. <laughs> While this particular case resulted in France using its judicial powers to protect the cultural property of Cambodia, it did not prevent the continued destruction and removal of objects from other important cultural sites. The collection at the Musée Guimet in France, or in Paris rather, is a testament to the collecting of Cambodian art by private individuals and French authorities during the colonial period. The museum was founded by Emile Guimet in 1879, who was encouraged by the French government to learn the religions of the Far East. As part of his education, he traveled to Asia and brought back with him artworks, which ultimately became part of his museum. The museum's collection also includes works of art that were sponsored by French expeditions. So these were expeditions that were sponsored by the government. Objects such as the 7th century stone sculpture of a Harihara, which you see here, entered the collection of the Musée Guimet in 1882 and was part of the Aimonier mission, which was an archaeological mission sponsored by the government, as well as a Banyan period, which you see here, Sculpture of a kneeling Tara, which entered the collection in 1931 through the auspices of the École Française d'Extreme Orient. Today, the collection of Khmer art at the Musée Guimet represents the finest of its kind outside of Cambodia. Unlike India, Cambodia did not formally implement legislation dedicated exclusively to cultural property and cultural heritage and its exports until 1996, 43 years after its independence from France in 1953. However, earlier decrees, such as those in the Cambodian Constitution of 1993, contains language making explicit the government's responsibility towards the protection and preservation of historic sites, as well as severe punishment of those who desecrate cultural and artistic heritage. Cambodia was, however, an early adopter of the UNESCO Convention on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property, which was written in 1970. Cambodia ratified this in 1972. The ratification of the convention was to a certain degree self-executing and thus did not result in the implementation of legislation. So just as a note, um, the US did not formalize any sort of legislation protecting cultural property until 1983. So Cambodia was um, one of the earlier adopters. This was likely the result of many factors. Most obvious uh, was Cambodia's rule at the time by the Khmer Rouge. In 1996, the Law on the Protection of Cultural Heritage was passed, which aimed to protect national cultural heritage and property against illegal destruction, modification, excavation, importation, or exportation. Furthermore, the law placed cultural heritage and property under national ownership. 
In 2002, the 1996 law was augmented by the sub-decree of respecting implementation of cultural heritage protection, which focused on regulating the trade in cultural property and its export and control. Nations such as India and Cambodia continue to refine their laws in order to protect their cultural property from leaving their borders. The sale and collection of ancient art does not appear to subside, as recent international art fairs demonstrate. Projected, what you'll see is a list of some of the most high-profile South and Southeast Asian repatriation cases, which resulted in the return of cultural prop property. And so I've focused on South and Southeast Asia because these are my areas of expertise. When known, their current locations are also indicated. Please note that this is not an exhaustive list and is represented mostly by works of art that um, I discussed in full in my book chapter and that is partially discussed in this talk. Um, and you'll see that most of these objects have been returned to European and American institutions and corporations. Um, what I have found, though, that there are certain patterns of what is collected, what is returned, and what I also found was that there's a marked decline of high-profile repatriation cases in the late 90s and in the early 2000s between European and American institutions and between South and Southeast Asian institutions. So these are um, more recent um, returns. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to focus on two case studies. Um, in my book chapter, I examine more case studies, but for this talk, we're just going to look at one Indian example and one Cambodian example. And I'll begin with the Indian example first. <clears throat> in October 2011, Subhash Kapoor, the well-known art dealer and owner of the Art of the Past Gallery in Manhattan, was arrested on charges of theft and smuggling of antiquities. His arrest was the conclusion of three years of investigation into his dealings by the Division of Homeland Security Investigations, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. During the probe and in the following years, his arrest is um, what has become known as Operation Hidden Idol. <clears throat> Antiquities from South Asia worth millions of dollars, some have reported in upwards of $100 million, were found in his storehouses in New York and New Jersey, as well as a trove of emails, dossiers, written correspondence, receipts, among other incriminating evidence. So since his arrest, other art dealers have been arrested as well because um, in these dossiers and emails, it's implicated other um, dealers. While Kapoor remains in prison in India, many works associated with him and his gallery continue to reside in the West. As one of the most important dealers of South Asian art, Kapoor donated and sold works of art to some of the finest institutions in the world. One such museum was the National Gallery of Australia, <coughs> um, which I'll refer to as the NGA, which in 2008 purchased this 11th to 12th century bronze sculpture of Nataraja, originally from Bredheshwar Temple in Sri Aparanthan in, in India. According to Indian police and the Archaeological Survey of India, Kapoor and his associates in India stole the sculpture along with seven other Chola period bronzes from the temple in 2006. That same year, these sculptures were shipped to New York along with modern replicas in order to thwart suspicion. Kapoor began creating a false provenance for these sculptures, including letters of ownership claiming the removal from India in 1971 to ensure alignment with India's ratification of the 1970 UNESCO Convention, which they ratified in 1977. He also quickly registered the sculptures with the Art Loss Register in order to receive a certificate that ensured that they were not stolen or works of art. The Indian authorities did not discover the removal of the sculptures until 2008. According to the NGA, Kapoor made the Nataraja known to curators at the gallery in 2006. In 2008, after doing their own due diligence, including searching through known art theft databases such as Interpol, checking with the Tamil Nadu police idol wing, and securing letters of previous ownership, as well as the certificate from the Art Loss Register, they purchased the sculpture for $5 million US dollars. The eventual return of the Nataraja statue was the direct result of neither the Indian government's call for the repatriation nor the NGA's initial largesse. Instead, much of the sleuthing and public pressure for the return of the sculpture came from private individuals and media outlets, including Vijay Kumar, who you see there, a self-proclaimed art enthusiast who runs a website called the Indian Pride Project, and Jason Felch, who runs the website Chasing Aphrodite. Some of you may know that he used to be a reporter at the LA Times, and he wrote the, um, the book Chasing Aphrodite, which talks about um, you know issues of collecting at 
local institutions here, such as the Getty Villa. In 2013, both Kumar and Felch made materials on the Nataraja available to anyone who had access to the internet. These included photos taken by the New York Police Department from Kapoor's home, which showed the icon in a contemporary home in India, as well as photos dated to 1994 of the sculpture archived at the French Institute of Pondicherry, proving that it did not leave India in 1971, as Kapoor had claimed and as the NGA had maintained. Public pressure and the terrible publicity incurred by the NGA eventually led to the return of the sculpture to India. And on September 4, 2014, <coughs> In New Delhi, the Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott handed over the, to the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi the Nataraja, along with other, another, I'm um, sorry, another Chola period sculpture once in the collection of the Art Gallery of New South Wales. When local villagers in um, Sri Puranthan learned of the sculpture's return, the community chimed in on how the icon should be restored. A Mr. Uh, Ula Ganthan, a villager and the district secretary of the Communist Party of India, said, quote, we will feel doubly happy if the idol is returned to the temple, unquote. And one should note that these sculptures are, are of Hindu deities, and um, India is primarily a Hindu-worshipping population. And so for Hindus, these sculptures are not just inanimate works of art, but they indeed represent the gods themselves. So in an earlier case, um, that implicated the Norton Simon Museum, so this took place in the 80s. Um, the the Nataraja sculpture um, defended itself in court as a, as a living um, being. And this also, was, there was another instance of this as well with the Bumper Corporation in Canada, which happened even earlier. In November of that year, the sculpture was paraded in the streets of Sri Puranthan and briefly placed on its original altar in the temple before being returned to a treasure vault. It was determined that the temple was not a suitable site for the icon and that it would instead be housed in a museum, but it would return annually to the temple for festivals. Intentions for the sculpture to be continuously accessible to the public when not conducting its ritual activities were not ever fully realized. Today, the sculpture is housed in the Archaeological Survey of the India Icon Center. Um, essentially, it's in a treasure house where it doesn't have access to anyone. And the only people who have access to it are government officials and um, Hindu priests who go in and do the you know, different ceremonies um, for the sculptures. The fate of the Nataraja was to be locked away in a treasure house, away from the site of worshippers and viewers, rather than a house of worship or another public institution. Very few repatriated artworks from India have been permanently returned to the original sites or to spaces accessible to the public. This includes some 200 objects linked to Kapoor that were returned to the Indian government on June 6, 2016. According to sources at the Indian Ministry of Culture, quote, now the problem is, if we get these antique idols back to India, where will we keep them? We can't dump them randomly at museums as many of them have high religious value. And on the other hand, if we reinstall them at the temples or other places where they used to be, who will take care of the security of these items?" Unquote. So this continues to be the fate of these objects. <clears throat> so now we're going to, sorry, I must have clicked on a little too soon. We're going to move on to case study number two, and these are the Perception Temple sculptures in Cambodia. So just months before the arrest of Subhash Kapoor in 2011, Sotheby's and other auction houses were preparing for Asia Week. Asia Week takes place in the second week of March when curators, collectors, and specialists convene in New York to purchase items for their collection. So this happens every year. On the front cover of the Sotheby's catalog, which you see here, was a handsome 10th century stone sculpture of an athlete, later identified by the archaeologist Dr. Eric Bourdonneau as Duryodhana from the Hindu epic, the Mahabharata. Inside of the catalog, the sculpture was advertised as the pendant to a similar sculpture at the Norton Simon Museum, coming from the collection of, quote, a noble European family who had purchased it in 1975. I should note here that I was the curator of Asian art at the Norton Simon from 2010 to 2015, so precisely the years when this case study is taking place. Specialists in Cambodia and elsewhere were already well aware of the sculpture housed at the Norton Simon Museum, but the celebratory nature of the sale of its mate gave them the opportunity to request it and other sculptures from the same temple and Western museums to be returned to Cambodia. In 2007, Dr. Simon Warwick, an expert in stone conservation working in Cambodia, had found two sets of pedestaled feet in situ at the Prasachan Temple. 
one of which he believed belonged to the sculpture of the Norton Simon. Because ancient sculpture, especially that from Southeast Asia, is rarely inscribed with information such as date, donor, artist, um, art historians, such as myself, must rely on stylistic analysis to identify unscientifically excavated art. They do so by comparing unprovenanced objects with sculptures known to be associated with a particular temple site. Such insubstantial proof, along with the absence of formal legislation making cultural objects the property of the nation until 1993, and restrictions on the export of cultural property in until 1996, made it difficult for Cambodia to make a claim for the return of the Norton Simon sculpture, which Norton Simon purchased in 1976. So the sculpture was purchased in 1976, um, so there was no legislation formally put in place beyond the adoption and ratification of the UNESCO Convention in Cambodia. It also predates the US uh, ratification of any um, legislation in 1983. So technically, it's safe. The sculpture was pulled from auction just a day before it was to take place. So now I'm talking about the Sotheby's sculpture. Um, <clears throat> specialists and Cambodian officials urged their own government to halt the sale. Working with the US government, Cambodia sued Sotheby's for the return of the sculpture. And after a year-long lawsuit, Sotheby's and the owner of the sculpture agreed to return it to Cambodia. During the lawsuit, museums in America with sculptures that were believed to be from Prasat Chen were also under pressure by scholars, the media, and the US government to return them to Cambodia. While the Cambodian government did not formally request objects from the museums, in this new media age with its endless news cycles and long-term memory, it made it difficult for museums to quietly shrink away or negotiate lengthy deals. So in 2013, with the handover of two kneeling figures, as you see here, um, of the Pandava brothers from their collection, the Met became the first museum to return sculptures from Prasat Chen. On June 3rd, 2014, sculptures from Sotheby's, the Norton Simon Museum, and Christie's were returned and unveiled during an elaborate ceremony presided over by the Deputy Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Cambodia, uh, Sok An in Phnom Penh. These sculptures have since been rejoined by statues of Hanuman from the Cleveland Museum, and Rama from the Denver Museum of Art in 2016. Today, all of the sculptures are at the National Museum in Phnom Penh. The long-term goal of the museum is to recreate the statue's original configuration at the temple within its galleries. In 2014, the National Museum installed a three-month temporary exhibition titled Return Statues to Cambodia, which featured all five of the then repatriated statues. Today, the sculptures of Nakula and Sahadeva, which were returned from the, the Met Museum, and Balarama from Sotheby's are all in view at the museum. So the two sets of these kneeling figures and the Sotheby's uh, Balarama, or sorry, um, are on view, but all of the others are um, in the stone conservation lab. So they're being um, remounted to ori their original pedestals. Art museums, big and small, private and public, ethnographic or encyclopedic in nature, all contain within them objects that were made long ago and often far away. Increasingly, museums in the West have been asked to return objects to their places of origin. The calls for repatriation of such objects are often couched in language intending to restore cultural heritage and to unite fragmented works of art to one another or to their original sites. However, as described in this talk, this isn't always realized. Once returned, these objects become centerpieces for political exhibitionism, celebrated by the media and government officials in elaborate public ceremonies. However, when the lights are out and the pageantry is over, many of the objects are returned not to their original temple settings, but instead to museums or storehouses where they are kept away from future theft, such as the case for repatriated Indian cultural property. The fate of returned Southeast Asian objects appear, at least from equally prominent repatriation cases, to be far more favorable than those of their South Asian counterparts. The two examples discussed in this talk are the sculptures of Van Tysre, which the French government returned to the original site in 1924, um, as well as the Prasat Chen temple sculptures, which are now at the National Museum. The fate of repatriated objects to Southeast Asia reflect the ideal situation for all parties involved. Museums and their publics in the West want to know that when objects that they have cared for and admired leave, they are restored to their original sites or made available to others, thus mirroring the claims for their turn in the first place. When repatriated objects return to a fate lesser than that in the West, 
um, such as the case of the Nataraja sculpture that we discuss, it's difficult for almost everyone involved to argue that such cultural property is better off at home. Unable to occupy their formal religious functions or as objects of study and admiration, it appears that it, what is most likely at stake is the authority of who is able to control such cultural property. In her essay, Our Gods, Their Museums, The Contrary Careers of India's Art Objects, Dr. Tsapati Guha Tukurta writes, quote, from 1947 onwards, the national identity of Indian art abroad would be centrally premised on the strength and authority of the nation's own art establishment, on India's extensive network of central, provincial, and site museums, without whose cooperation no exhibition of scale and quality could be mounted in foreign museums." Unquote. What nations in South and Southeast Asia have in common is the need and desire to claim their own political authority and cultural legitimacy within a Euro-American-centric global politics. When India achieved independence in 1947, the new government organized an exhibition of Indian sculpture at the Royal Academy of Arts in London to commemorate the transfer of power and the arrival of India's independence. By using art as cultural ambassadors, the Indian government was not only demonstrating their own extensive history and cultural achievements, but also reclaiming their authority to control it. Today, India reclaims its authority not in blockbuster traveling exhibitions, but through the repatriation of objects abroad. The repatriation and restoration of cultural property in Southeast Asia serves a similar role. The return of the Prasatchen, the Prasatchen sculptures endows the Cambodian government with authority and legitimacy, but is also seen as a further investment in their local economy. According to the World Travel and Tourism Council in 2017, tourism accounted or contributed to 32.4% of the GDP in Cambodia. In comparison, tourism contributed to 7.7% of the GDP for the US economy, so it's, it's huge. Much of the tourism dollars in Cambodia comes from travel to Siem Reap, where the Angkor Archaeological Park is located. Thus, one can argue that the repatriation of cultural property by Southeast Asian nations and their return to cultural sites is just as politically, politically motivated as that of India. However, government officials and cultural administrators of Cambodia understand the financial and political benefit of having such objects circulate in the public sphere rather than locked away in treasury houses. While the benefit of such returns for governments and politicians is clear, what is unclear is how repatriated cultural property most benefits the people living in these countries. Does the average Indian or Khmer citizen desire to have such cultural property returned? Once returned, do they have access to the objects in a meaningful way? Would citizens desire for artworks from different parts of the world to be displayed in their museums? So these are questions that I'm, you know, I been grappling with. And having worked on and researched issues related to cultural property rest repatriation for the last several years, I've become increasingly discouraged as I continue to see and to read and to take part in the same discussions that have plagued us for many generations. We have not come up with any meaningful solutions. And so these are some of the systematic problems, I think, that, um, that we could, you know, as associated with uh, colonialism in the South and Southeast Asian region. So almost all of South and Southeast Asia was uh, colonized at some point in its history. Um, the reason why we haven't come up with any meaningful solutions is because each party, each institution, each nation have their own interests and agendas, which are rarely ever aligned. And so the question of who owns art and who owns the past continues. And so for the remainder of this talk, I want to discuss the idea of ownership from my perspective as a curator and now as an art history professor here at LMU. And this portion of the talk is, uh, is much more personal. Um, and it doesn't represent any of the research that I included in the book chapter, so this is totally different. Um, instead, I presented portions of this at the National University of Singapore this past summer to a group of curators and directors for museums throughout Southeast Asia, which was sponsored by the Freer Sackler Museum and SOAS at the University of London. As I had previously mentioned, I was the curator of Asian art at the Norton Simon Museum. I was there during the years that the Bhima sculpture from Prasat Chen Temple was repatriated to Cambodia. And what I can tell you, so just so you remember what it looks like, what I can tell you that um, while I was a curator at the museum, I fully understood the reasons why the sculpture should be returned to Cambodia, and I fully supported its return. However, even I was shocked by the sadness that I experienced in the loss of the sculpture from the museum's galleries. 
As a curator, one of your many jobs is to be a storyteller. On a professional level, the loss of the Bemis sculpture made it difficult for me as a Zen curator at the Norton Simon Museum to tell a story of the development and history of Khmer art because the sculpture represented a unique period in which freestanding sculpture was both dynamic in its execution and also its narrative possibilities. On a personal level, I knew that the loss of the sculpture from the galleries would have an impact on the museum's visitors who may never have the opportunity to visit Cambodia and discover its rich artistic heritage and who know little about Cambodia outside of the single paragraph in their high school textbooks, which talk about the Khmer Rouge. But it also made me think of the Cambodian diaspora in the greater Los Angeles area, which makes up roughly 15% of the total Khmer population in the US. Now that number is larger if we consider the state of California, where the Khmer population represents 24% of the total Khmer um, population in the US overall. And I say this as a child growing up, um, my parents conveyed very little to me of my Thai culture, of my Thai heritage. And there are a number of reasons for this, um, one of which is because I grew up in a very homogeneous Iowa. But I remember seeing Thai sculptures and paintings at the Art Institute in Chicago for the first time and being fascinated by their beauty and really proud to see them alongside masterpieces of Western art. Um, it was this and other similar experiences which led me to my eventual study of Thai art and why I'm here today. While the repatriation of cultural heritage to nations such as India, Cambodia, and Thailand are immensely important in allowing the children and adults in these and other countries to also better understand and illustrate their heritage amongst um, many other injustices that have resulted in the colonization of much of the South and Southeast Asian region, I wonder if there are alternative models to repatriation that better allows for access. And when I speak of access, I speak of not only access to one's personal cultural heritage, but also access to the world's cultural heritage, and by extension, our collective human heritage. I've also begun thinking about how such alternative models may reflect a growing generational shift towards a sharing economy, which we are beginning to see with greater prevalence. So I happen to be married to someone who works for SpaceX and who works on a number of projects related to Elon's enterprises, and a sister of someone who worked for Facebook, but who's now at Lyft. So all three of these corporations and their industries fall under the category of disruptive innovation. In my household, we often discuss how transportation, both terrestrial and interplanetary, will look in our lifetime and that of my sons. If I'm to believe my husband and brother, in my son's lifetime, ownership of a car will no longer have the same value as it does today. It will not be equated with freedom of movement, prestige of ownership, et cetera. Instead, what we are seeing with increased usage of ride shares and the eventual streamlining of autonomous vehicles is that we will be moving towards a shared, albeit incredibly corporatized, economy. As historians, we know that generational shifts in industry and technology do affect what we do as historians because it affects the creation of art and the movement of art. It impacts, its impact may not be as great as those in other fields, but it still impacts us. For example, the digital age, which some argue would be the demise of the museum and visitor, oh, sorry, the demise of museum and visitor, visitor engagement. Because why would someone go to a museum if they can see the same thing from every angle, zoomed in, zoomed out, from the comfort of their computer or phone? However, one may argue that the digitization of museum collections have made the experience of the original all that much more important and exclusive. To capitalize on this, some museums not only allow, but now steer visitors to Instagram-ready selfies with the original. So perhaps the most famous, right, is um, the Mona Lisa. So if the barons of industry are moving us towards a sharing economy, and I put that in quotes, how can we begin to think about sharing in our own fields? Can we and should we make access to art and the sharing of art inextricably linked to one another. What would this look like? How does that redefine ownership and all of the responsibilities that come along with it, such as preservation and conservation? So this is a question that I posed um, to the people that I presented to because they understand the enormous cost of you know, taking care of these objects in, once they're in the museum. While I don't have the answers, we have already been witness to how changes and alternatives to strict ideas of repatriation, which is the one-way transfer of ownership, are instituted by some museums through art exchanges and long-term loans. In 2015, the National Museum of Cambodia forged a cultural cooperation agreement with the Cleveland Museum of Art, following the return and 
transfer of ownership of the Hanuman sculpture, which we discussed earlier. Quote, the agreement allowed for exceptional works of art to be lent for exhibition at the Cleveland Museum of Art in order to promote knowledge and appreciation of Cambodians, uh, Cambodia's cultural heritage, unquote. What resulted was an exhibition entitled Beyond Encore, an imposing relief sculptural travels from Cambodia to Cleveland. The exhibition featured a section of bow relief of a 10-armed Lokaveshvara from Bhante Shmar Temple. In another example, the exhibition Encore, which you see here, exploring Cambodia's sacred city at the Asian Civilization Museum in Singapore, brought works from the Musée Guimet collected during France's colonization of Cambodia to Singapore. Now, the first exhibition that we just briefly discussed in Cleveland saw the return of an important sculpture to Cambodia while allowing visitors of the Cleveland Museum to continue to learn about Khmer art and culture through loans. The second example allows for the short-term return of Angkor period objects to the region of Southeast Asia. But what would an exhibition where masterpieces of Western art and the world's art history from European and American encyclopedic museums to former colonies look like? One example is the exhibition India in the World, a History of Nine Stories, which brought together collections from Indian museums as well as the British Museum to showcase works of art from all over the world to visitors at two different Indian institutions. Prehistoric Japanese ceramics, Egyptian reliefs, Roman sculptures, French crucifixes uh, were brought over from the British Museum and were on display alongside Indian works of art in India. Such exchanges are monumental tasks that take the concerted efforts of museum professionals and government officials. The cost of such exchanges and exhibitions are equally monumental. India and the World was financed by both national and international as well as private and public funds, such as that from the Getty Foundation and the Tata Trust. These sorts of exchanges, or sharing if you will, provide opportunities for visitors to see, in the flesh, with their own eyes, works of art from cultures different from their own, and one hopes that such exhibitions provide greater context and opportunities for understanding. They also allow us to have uncomfortable but important conversations about the past and our shared histories, and how they continue to impact us today. I use it as an, as a, oh, sorry. I use it as an example the exchange between the National Museum in Cambodia and the Musée Guimet in France, which reunited the head and torso of a 7th century Harihara sculpture. By reuniting the head, which was at the Guimet collection for 130 years, so this head was uh, in Paris for 130 years, with a torso in Cambodia, it allows the National Museum to have an important conversation about past and current inequalities, that were and can still be experienced to this day owing to France's colonization of the nation. In exchange, the Musée Guimet received a loan of sculptural fragments to a 10th century image of Uma. But these exchanges, which are important steps to providing access to art and culture, still seem very inadequate to me. First, because such exchanges seem to continue to benefit wealthier institutions and countries. And second, while citizens from source countries, such as India and Cambodia, are given access to items lost, looted, and acquired during occupation. What about those same citizens' access to the world's cultural heritage? In other words, why is it that we have access from art around the world in Los Angeles, but my niece, Frank, in Bangkok does not? So if you go to the museums in Thailand, right, it's Thai art. There isn't art from other countries. And this is true for most other nations as well. <laughs> It's important to note here, for those of you who don't already know it, but encyclopedic museums exist primarily in the West. Such institutions have had hundreds of years to collect art through purchase, patronage, and through pillage. It would take tremendous amounts of money to be able to put together a new world-class encyclopedic museum because works of art, particularly those that have become part of the canon, are so expensive to buy. So I use these two paintings by Leonardo da Vinci as examples. So if you know a museum were to try to do this, um, they would, you know, so for example, if the Mona Lisa were to come on market, its estimated value would be $800 million, right? Um, and this painting of Salvatore Mundi recently sold last year for 400 and over $450 million. Um, I think we can all agree that communities and people around the world are becoming increasingly interconnected by Facebook, by global supply and production chains, but we also seem to be dividing into our tribes, into our nations. I say this during a time when some of our world's leaders have been calling for isolationism and protectionism in the face of demographic, industrial, technological, and climate change. 
among other things. One way that we as art historians, as teachers, as curators, as students, and as advocates of art can combat such protectionism, I think, is to consider how we make art more accessible. And please don't think that I'm calling for the end of repatriation, because I'm not. I'm just wondering how we can better leverage the past for a different kind of future. I understand that sharing is hard. I discuss it daily with my five-year-old son. I also understand that the cost of loans and exchanges are astronomical and that every time you move a work of art, you're compromising it. But what I hope to have demonstrated with the aforementioned exhibitions is that it's possible to create opportunities for access. My hope is that the exhibitions like India in the World and the reunion and exchange of art between the National Museum in Phnom Penh and the Musée Guimé is that they become the norm and not the exception. But this will require everyone to understand and believe in a shared human history. At this moment in time, it kind of feels like a pipe dream. Um, but I watched my husband and his company fail, crash, blow up several rockets until they finally uh, set one up into outer space and had it return upright on a barge in the middle of Atlantic Ocean. So while it's true that what we, what we do is not rocket science, uh, rocket science, it's in fact much more complicated and difficult because humans are incredibly complicated and can be incredibly difficult. Thank you.